The colonial era may have been a crucially important time in American history, but it probably didn't smell too hot. Hygiene practices during America's colonial era boil down to a curious mix of practicality, religious belief, and social position. A lack of hygiene was often thought to be indicative of bad manners, and religious people associated it with the sin of sloth. Today, we're going to take a look at what hygiene was like in colonial America. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, we would really appreciate it if you would leave a comment and let us know what other aspects of early American life you would like to hear more about next. Okay, hold your breath, because we got some colonial stank coming at you. Captain John Smith was a key figure in the history of the Jamestown colony who recorded his experiences in America in great detail. Those experiences apparently involved a lot of bugs. His writings contain references to troublesome ants and noisy bugs like mosquitoes and flies, as well as a certain India bug called by the Spaniards a cuckarooch. George Washington, while staying at a bug-infested cabin in the Shenandoah Valley in 1748, complained that his blanket was full of vermin like lice and fleas. The experience taught him to prefer sleeping outdoors, closer to lit campfires. A Christian missionary named George Henry Loskiel recorded a troublesome plague to both man and beast, which he called living ashes. According to Loskiel, the Native Americans had named them such because their bites were as painful as being burned by a red-hot ash. Back in colonial times, full-body baths of the kind people commonly take today were rare and typically reserved for infants. Even then, the purpose of the bath was more about hardening the infants against disease as opposed to cleaning them. As for adults and children, they didn't usually bathe, they just washed, and they didn't wash much. Each morning, a typical person would likely rinse their face and hands with a cloth using a basin and sponge, but that's about it. Those who could afford a bathtub usually only had one large enough for a sponge bath, and even those were taken without soap. For those who couldn't afford a tub, a dip in a local lake or stream on a hot day was likely the closest they'd ever come to anything like a bath. Indoor plumbing still being a ways off, colonial houses instead had outhouses, or often just a covered hole in the ground somewhere close to the building. If you couldn't make it to the outhouse, you could use a chamber pot inside. These chamber pots had to be emptied regularly, but that usually just involved dumping them out a window. The procedure wasn't terribly difficult, but it did have some downsides. Namely, people in rural areas often lived close to their water sources. The haphazard sewage control meant that waste would often find its way into the drinking water and wind up spreading disease. Interestingly, it wasn't just waste that wound up in the holes. In 2014, archaeologists excavated a dozen brick-lined privy shafts from a site that was an illegal tavern in colonial times. Far from just sewage, the dig found bottles, bowls, glasses, drinking tankards, tanning supplies, wig curlers, and pottery made by local artisans. Colonial America was not big on sanitation. Outhouses were typically close to water sources, and it wasn't unusual for streets to be clogged with garbage and animal feces. This lack of sanitation meant disease could spread quickly and easily. Dysentery, typhoid fever, and cholera were all common, especially during summer. Even the American Revolution was affected. It's believed that two-thirds of George Washington's troops at Valley Forge in December of 1777 died of dysentery, influenza, or typhoid fever. On the flip side, the Continental Army may have also benefited from the deplorable conditions, as large numbers of British troops in the South were killed by various fevers. Even among scientists of the era, hygiene was not well understood. Some doctors believed that cleanliness helped to prevent illness and disease, but others favored theories that revolved around bodily oils. In the absence of a compelling scientific explanation, people turned to religion for guidance, and religion was happy to oblige. For the Puritans, cleanliness was more of a moral issue. They saw a direct connection between spiritual health and the cleanliness of people's bodies, clothes, homes, and towns. Moreover, they believed water was purifying and could cleanse the filthiness of the mind as well as the body. 
Accordingly, those who bathed were seen as less likely to engage in other sins and less likely to be poor. All of this, however, only really applied to private bathing. The Puritans felt public bathing had a negative impact on morality and was likely to lead to sexual impropriety and disease. They were big on cleanliness. They were Puritans, after all. Keeping teeth clean wasn't a big priority for people in the 17th century, and toothaches were common. The first line of defense against them was the usual natural remedies like chamomile or figs. If it was more serious than that, alcohol or even opium might have been used as a painkiller. Dental professionals were rare, and a person who needed a tooth pulled would usually have to get help from a tradesman like a blacksmith, a barber, or an apothecary. Replacing the pulled tooth was common, and sometimes the extracted tooth itself would simply be reinserted into its socket. More frequently, however, dentures and implants would be used. These were typically made from wood, ivory, and metal, and sometimes healthy teeth could even be purchased from poor people who were, sadly, often eager to sell them. George Washington was, of course, the most famous wearer of false teeth from the period. Folklore usually has him wearing wooden teeth, but in reality, they were made from metal, wire, and teeth of animals. That is badass. For the record, they were painful for him to wear and are said to have distorted the shape of his face, which makes him even more of a badass. Powdered wigs were all the rage among the middle and upper classes of the colonial era. Made from human and animal hair, both men and women wore them, while keeping their own hair extremely short. This was because of lice, which was very common at the time. Shaving the head would prevent the bugs from infesting one's hair. It didn't completely eliminate the problem, though. The wigs themselves were prone to infestations, and they had to be regularly cleaned by professionals. Ideally, wigs would receive this kind of care every week, but as the process was expensive, not everyone was quite so fastidious about it. Wig care included boiling the wig to kill lice and dousing it in fragrances like sassafras, bergamot, and bay leaves, which were believed to have bug-repellent properties. Conversely, the pomade used to style the wigs actually attracted insects, so that the whole thing was a bit of a <clears throat> wiggity whack. In the 1990s, an excavation took place at the original fort built at Jamestown. During that dig, archaeologists discovered a silver ear picker. Dating all the way back to the 17th century, the instrument had a small scooping tool at one end and pointed pick at the other end. Such picks were used as toothpicks, but also to clean out fingernails and for numerous other hygienic tasks. The scooper side was likely used to remove earwax, which was considered valuable due to its ability to keep thread from unraveling when beeswax was unavailable. Rich Americans have always liked fancy stuff from Europe, even in colonial times. Indeed, wealthier colonists were likely to have imported expensive fragrant soaps from across the Atlantic. However, those who couldn't afford to do that, which was most people, had to make their own soap or buy it locally. One type of soap available was lye soap, which was made using a time-consuming and foul-smelling process that involved mixing lye, ash, and animal fat. Lye soap was extremely harsh and usually used only for cleaning dishes, clothes, and things in the home that needed scrubbing. Doing laundry in colonial times was already pretty difficult. It involved hauling water, heating it with fire, wringing the clothes out by hand, and hanging up items to dry. Using the harsh lye soap didn't make it any easier. In practice, this meant only the items that got the dirtiest, like underwear or diapers, would be washed with any regularity. The women of colonial America didn't shave any part of their bodies. Moral standards of the time meant that women couldn't show any significant amount of skin, so there was no real point. Even hair on a woman's face was unlikely to be shaved, since shaving was dangerous and it was believed that bloodbaths could only be prevented by experienced hands. It is likely, however, that women plucked hairs and used depilatory or hair removal creams. Recipes for such creams have been found in medical handbooks that were in circulation at the time. One such recipe found in the 1540s The Birth of Mankind called for a mixture that included limestone and arsenic, among other things. 
It actually wouldn't be until the 1940s that shaving would become common for American women. America's founding fathers may have known a lot about democracy, but they didn't know much about how to talk to the ladies. Take, for example, Thomas Jefferson, who told his own daughter, Nothing is so disgusting to our sex as a want of cleanliness and delicacy in yours. Hmm, glad we could have this talk, Dad. Yes, cleanliness in women was a major topic of concern, and doctors of the time advised women to bathe as a way to cure illnesses that affected female reproductive organs. The prevailing wisdom actually held that women were able to become offensive to the nose for the purpose of keeping overly amorous men at bay. Dr. Thomas Ewell of Virginia stated it pretty concisely when he theorized that women used smell as a means of defense to ensure protection by rendering themselves as disgusting as possible. I'm gonna guess he didn't have a whole lot of female clients. George Washington was well aware of the risks disease posed to the Continental Army, and he was determined to do everything he could to avoid them. During the Revolution, he made it clear to his officers that cleanliness was essential to health and service, and he ordered them to watch out for contagions getting into camp. His specific concern at the time was smallpox, but the unsanitary conditions of most military camps meant it was far from the only threat. To help control the risk, Washington's men were supposed to clean their hands and faces once a day and their shirts once a week. However, only a few of the soldiers complied with the order. Maintaining cleanliness in the camps required laborers, known as followers. These followers, who could be men, women, or even children, traveled with the troops, cooked their meals, and cleaned up after them. One witness recorded the observation that the troops were not used to doing things of this sort and would sooner let their clothes rot on their backs than wash them for themselves. These followers who took care of the troops throughout the conflict are some of the unsung heroes of the American Revolution. So what do you think? Would you have liked living in colonial times? Would you stink to join up? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.